<laughs> um, so this is uh, Smith, no, I'm James. Um, <laughs> um, Nicole and I have been working on this, um, this uh, project together with Gareth and Yvonne Marshall uh, for a couple of years and we've both given different versions of it and written it up. So I'm going to dash through some of the social history that goes into the question of, of, of the deciphering of all this evidence very, very briefly before Nicole actually gets her teeth into the theoretical matters that have uh, emerged from um, our exercise and from our cogitations thereafter. Um, so we're going to look at a uh, portrait uh, tomb effigy of a lady called uh, Dame or Lady Mary May who uh, had her tomb placed in the chancel of St Nicholas's Parish Church in Mid Midlavent, West Sussex, which is about three miles north of Chichester. Um, it's a rebuilt church, as I will explain, and you can see the chancel in that direction through those uh, triple arches. Let me see the slides for you then. Can no, you around? that's right. I'll You're move right. around anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you move around? It's redundant. This is, uh, this is a, a picture of uh, Dame Mary May. Um, and it was a sculpture by a man called John Bushnell, who was a very famous sculptor at the end of the 17th century, who then went mad and tried to dis uh, destroy all his sculptures um, in the latter part of his life. But there are some that remain, and this is one of them. Uh, as you can see, he has a lengthy epitaph, or he's inscribed a lengthy epitaph, on the, uh, <coughs> the entablature underneath Dame Mary May. Uh, which gives her basic biography. Um, now, the problem with this particular tomb is that it's been massively altered over time. She got her tomb set up in 1671, uh, and then she died in 1676, uh, six years later, of the smallpox. But the tomb, as it originally was, was set up during her lifetime, in the chancel of the church that I've just been showing you um, and at the time she was alive and worshipping sitting in the pews in the chancel, the gentry pews. So there would have been this image of her li living body sitting side by side or at least very close to her sculptural memorial. This is by no means unusual at the time but what is unusual is that it was a woman who was doing this rather than a man. Usually this was a kind of patriarchal thing. Uh, uh, a thing that men, a uh, gentry, gentry folk, and aristocrats did. So it's been altered uh, very, uh, very profoundly. And the backstory is that uh, as she was lay dying of smallpox, she instructed her friends and family to uh, alter her, her portrait image with the pockmarks of smallpox uh, after her death. And the legend goes that this was done. The problem that uh, the research question that we were asking was, was this actually done or was this an, uh, uh, an anecdotal story? Was it apocryphal? Uh, and so as a result, we all thought we'll do some RTI just to find out whether or not we can tell whether the pop marks are there or whether you can see them uh, in any other way. Now, you can't see them if you actually look at the, the sculpture. If you go there by eye, they don't turn up in, in photography. But you can sort of feel them. And you, we didn't really know whether or not this, this meant that she'd been damaged uh, uh, accidentally because after all mar marble spores, uh, or whether or not uh, it, this, this was something that was a deliberate process. So what happened to her <coughs> after she uh, initially had this, um, this wonderful tomb sited in this corner, the, um, the northeast corner of, of the chancel, was that uh, after several years, uh, by the late 18th century, uh, the Dukes of, uh, of Richmond at Goodwood House took over the church as their patrons and they decided they wanted to move the tomb. It was taking up too much space of the chancel, so they brought it down into the nave and put it up against the south wall. So this is a very large tomb, you can imagine. It's not just what you see at the moment. It's got a huge... Um, so, uh, it's got lots of... Uh, uh, drapage and pilasters and things like that, as I'll show you very briefly. And so this whole thing was moved. During the 18th century, therefore, the, uh, the, local, uh, the local vicar decided it was too big, it was in the way, and therefore what he did was uh, he concealed it. He took the whole thing down 
and he put it in the vault under the, under the maze, the, 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 uh, the, the gentry vault where the maze were buried. So the whole thing got dismantled and it got completely hidden. Um, and for many years, even when Nicholas Pevsner arrived and had a look at the church, there was no sign of any of effigy. By uh, 1981, they decided to rebuild church and reorganise it as it had been so messed around in the 19th century. And uh, therefore, they, re uh, they, they um, resuscitated the, uh, the, the monument and they put it in an alcove in the, in the new north aisle of the church, which had been um, built by this particular uh, vicar, Reverend Stevens who had got rid of Dame Mary May. And this is what you see nowadays. She is hiding in her alcove. You can see her, you can touch her if you want to, uh, and you can certainly find a photograph of her, as I've done. And she's presented, she's, she's had all of her superstructure has been removed. Heaven alone knows where it is. All the putty, the sheriffs, the armorial uh, sculptures and things have, have vanished. And she's now stripped down to her effigy and to her epitaph. So she's presented as an artwork. She's lost the reality of it she had as a, a, a memorial and as a, as a figure, as a human being, with or without her pop marks, and she's become an artwork. She's been disembodied in many ways by this presentation of her. So therefore, we turn up uh, a, few, a few years ago and we have a, a, a made a decision to do RTI. And we've done this very elaborate series of RTIs, and I'll now pass, pass over to Nicole to explain how they work. So as um, Gareth mentioned this morning, this all came out of us uh, putting together this paper for the Internet Archaeology volume. And it represented quite a unique opportunity for us to actually reflect on the process uh, of doing an RTI. So I've done hundreds of RTIs, and it's not like I don't think about them when, when I'm doing them, um, but I come from a very particular perspective on RTIs. Somebody showed me how to do one once, I didn't really pay very much attention, then tried to do it out in the field teaching someone else before I really knew what I was doing. Um, and the whole kind of, uh, my process has developed out of a need to show other people how to do something. So I've sort of cobbled together a workflow. Um, for RTIs and uh, that comes from a very particular need to um, explain a moment of seeing something uh, and that's what the RTIs that, that I do do. They, they send uh, a, um, a falsehood out to somebody which is uh, something that I say is a compilation of 80 photographs and in fact isn't that at all um, and, and they see that data and it's a visualisation of, of, of something that I've recorded. So we sort of arrived at Day Mary May with all of those, uh, that kind of baggage uh, already, uh, already there. Um, and a lot of the RTIs that, that I've, yeah. Can I, uh, Do you want me to I, say what an RTI is? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I do have a slide for that. Um, we um, do a process quite a lot in the field called reflectance transformation imaging. And a lot of people have been talking about it over the last couple of days. And it's essentially computational photography. So you stick a digital SLR in front of an object that you're recording and you put a little shiny ball in it. Uh, and the shiny ball uh, sits in the same place and you don't move the camera and the thing you're recording doesn't move. And you take lots of photographs and in every photo you shine a light from a different direction. And you take lots of pictures, 50 to 80 photos, and in every single picture, the shiny ball, which is usually a snooker ball, but can be a ball bearing, depending on what scale of the thing you're recording is, the, the, the ball has a kind of shiny dot in it, which is the reflection from the flash. So you've had a, a light source in a different location at each point. Uh, and then there's some open source software that, that puts all of that information together and creates what we call a compiled uh, interactive image where you can kind of move the light source around. Um, but it's not actually compiling 80 photos together, it's creating a kind of fake uh, compilation of that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I've got one on my laptop that you can have a look at afterwards if you've not seen one before. So it, it takes all these images and puts them all together uh, and you can move the light source around and it gives you an interactive light. Um, and the benefit of doing that is that you can see things that are hard to see with the naked eye. And so um, that brings me to sort of the next uh, thing that I was thinking when we started yeah. to reflect on what we've done with Dame Mary May, is that we are um, already imagining what it is that we're going to be seeing and what it is that we're recording. Uh, and we then process the information already looking for that thing. So it brings out quite a lot of stuff that Rose was talking about this morning, um, in that we already have a kind of imagining uh, and we're processing our RTIs with that imagining in mind. 
Um, so it's a very visual uh, process. So the, the process, um, I was trying to think this morning of um, how I thought of RTI, and I think of it as a really social experience, because I don't think I've ever recorded an RTI without explaining to someone what it is that I'm doing. So I've never been left alone to just make an RTI. And because of that, I, I really associate it with talking really, really quickly and with kind of moving stuff around and showing people what I'm doing and sort of dancing around the thing that I'm recording and doing this kind of weird performance that's totally unplanned. Um, but, but continually talking and continually discussing what it is that we're doing. And Dame Mary May is a really nice example of that <clears> because we went to the church and we sat there all day and we drank loads of coffee from flasks and we discussed what we were doing and we processed as we went. So we were not just recording loads of stuff and then kind of putting it all in a bag and going away. We were processing as we went and as we were doing that, going through that workflow, we were then changing what we were doing to we're fit also, new research questions. We were also analysing you know, the nature of the, uh, of the object that we were looking at and, yeah. and, and recording its biography, discussing its biography. Yeah, so it yeah. It's very, a very social and very um, learning, good learning Process. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of learning and we're also making a lot of decisions. So there's a, there's a very complicated decision-making process that goes into recording and processing an RTI. And so um, Jude had already introduced the narrative of Dame Mary May. So we already had this kind of fable um, of the object that we were going to be recording. And then when we arrived, you know, she's a big lady in an alcove, really hard to get to, made from stone. So she's not a headstone, which is what I've had a lot of experience with, but she's still made from the same material, but incredibly three. And so there were lots of challenges there um, for the, the actual practical recording of the RTI. So as we're recording it, we're choosing what we're going to be looking for. And so the next thing that that made me sort of think about is... Um, the way that the RTIs don't stand alone at all. So we never go and record an RTI of something that we know nothing about. We always have some kind of background information and some sort of research question that someone's given us that we're helping them to, to, to look for, this kind of moment of um, reveal, the big reveal of the RTI. Um, and so because of that, the RTIs can't stand alone. They have to be part of... Um, uh, a, a much, much bigger process, a much longer workflow. And so with Dame Mary May, the RTIs <coughs> beforehand and afterwards are being connected to the historical record and the archaeological record. Um, and there's, there's all that kind of knitting together of the source materials and the material evidence. Um, and the RTIs are interrogating that and they're maybe revealing very small parts of that, um, but actually they're just a very, very small, small moment uh, in the analysis and the interpretation of Dame Mary May. So as we're recording her, we're discussing um, and interpreting, we're making amendments to the process, and I was writing down things that we were talking about, so we were looking for um, superimposition, angle and depth of actual pockmarks, evidence of pockmarks on her, on her face, um, and we're doing that while we're kind of dancing around this tomb in a church. Um, and we're sort of then we're thinking about much more complicated questions like the quality of work, um, whether work's been done in situ, that kind of thing. So then we're switching lenses and making lots of um, changes to what it is that we're doing. And the, um, the outputs from that um, reflect what it was that we were doing because we're constantly thinking about scale, um, directionality, uh, multiple viewpoints. And so we're never doing a comprehensive survey and we're not really doing prospection. We already think we know what it is that we're going to see um, and then we're hunting for that using the RTIs to kind of uh, bring that out visually. Um, and RTI uses photographic conventions, so it's, pre it's presenting this kind of synthetic um, interactive uh, image that you can manipulate, um, but there's this real severance between the sort of original captured photographs that we're taking and then this kind of complex algorithmic set of tasks that are occurring before you get this output, this really pretty uh, RTI. Um, and so, and actually that kind of... Um, ties into the point that Jeremy was saying earlier on that the reflectance transfer imaging was not made for archaeology and so we've kind of repurposed something that wasn't really meant for this, this end use and I think Dame Mary May really pushed it to its limits because it's yeah. such a three dimensional it's a big, it's yeah and it's and it, she's a she's a big lady so um, <laughs> so uh, reading the results we, we as I was saying we were doing it while we were in the church and what we're doing is we're combining lots of different RTIs from lots of different perspectives. Um, and so they're never standing alone. And we're having this kind of learning experience. So Gareth and I are learning that you can't 
photograph marble using a reflective technique. So that's basically, uh, they just, the two don't marry very well. Um, and Jude and Yvonne are looking at how we do an RTI, and that's kind of affecting um, what it is that we're sort of, the, the, the way that we're contemplating the materiality of the object is being impacted by, yes. the, by the technique. So we're sort of talking about three centuries of movement um, over about 500 photographs. Um, so it's quite a kind of romp mm. through, um, through her, uh, through the, the biography of the object, but also the kind of usefulness of the technique. And with all digital archaeological practice, we learned it in the field, so there's a lot of trial and error. And even, you know, after, um, so we did this in 2013, so we've mm. been doing RTIs for six years, and um, we're already still kind of making changes and, 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 and innovations. So um, our results uh, indicating that there was, um, there is deliber deliberate marking um, on the on the tomb, and um, there were some moments of discovery, despite the fact that we weren't actually uh, conducting a sort of <coughs> prospection um, of her. We, we we felt that we knew where the details were going to be. So I've just got some nice images which don't come out quite so um, beautifully uh, on the big screen here. Um, but I just think that they sort of illustrate the, the kinds of details that we were starting to pick out. So um, this one is showing the uh, finishing. Um, this one is showing the sort of differing depths of, of pock marks. Um, it's an image here that shows uh, uncorrected mistakes, so the fact that later work was not quite such uh, high quality. Um, there's lots of um, RTIs show the difference between um, mistakes in the fine detailing um, and the way that those things are... Um, compared. So there's lots of these images and we kind of used still images for the publication because we felt that that maybe helped to highlight a little bit the sort of conceit of RTI because this interactive image really is such a falsehood um, and there's no real way to get away from, um, as Gareth saying, the kind of conventions, the cinematic conventions <coughs> and the conventions in photography. So we've used still images but we're including a, an RTI that you can kind of down download and, and, and really interrogate yourself um, because I think it's, there's a, there's a Quite, there's an issue really with the, the format that these, these final um, yeah. productions, <coughs> these final outputs take and how you can actually then show what it is that you saw. Um, so the, the open source software has a, a little um, thing that's been built into it that lets you bookmark moments uh, of, of viewing onto an RTI and we started to experiment with those as part of this yeah. Um, paper because that gave us a way to, um, so we included the bookmarks um, as a way to include the conversations that we'd had about the RTIs within the actual publication of the RTIs themselves. So we're trying to kind of bring a bit of transparency to the decisions that were made um, about the production of the, the eventual still images. So um, the sort of final thing to say is actually Jude's words from the paper, uh, so you should go and read, read the, the details, um, but the, um, the RTI day really is a kind of very small event uh, within the sort of 339 years of Dame Mary May's tomb, um, and that the tomb is kind of continuing to exercise its own um, agency and, and its own, uh, with its own legends, uh, travelling around the space, um, arguments, concealment, cultural restoration, um, and the pockmarking, I think, adds a kind of extra depth mm. to the story um, and the biography and our sort of very brief encounter with it as a sort of moment in history. Could I just have one more minute? Just as a you know, final coda, um, I think you know, what Nicole's just been saying about the process of RTI, the social process of RTI, is, is, is one of its great virtues and its, its great mm. strengths. Uh, from my point of view as a uh, social historical archaeologist, I found it absolutely fabulously useful because it's an engagement with bodily form and function. I study tombs, I study churches and things like that, that's my area. Um, but as soon as you get the opportunity to engage with a portrait effigy of this kind, this you know, late Renaissance kind, um, it means that the body somehow uh, becomes alive. And I'm doing a great deal of research at the moment about, or I'm starting to do some research, into the uh, visceral uh, effects that uh, tomb effigies such as then Mary may have. And I think that I would not have been able to have uh, started to, to go in that direction without using this kind of effort, uh, exercise and project that we've been doing. Um, so I recommend it mm. heartily to, uh, to anybody 
for that particular form of engagement. And I think you develop, whether you want it or not, an intimacy with the thing yes. that you're recording. Yes, very much. <laughs> whether yeah. you've asked for that, for that or not, I think that's something that if you're doing a process like that, it's inevitable, you can't really avoid right. the... The relationship that, that builds between the artifact and the and very much in yeah. the, the agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I often wonder if we took away the flash and the and the camera and recorded what we were actually doing, what it would look like, because it is literally like we're hugging the object over and over again yeah. in different ways. So it would be quite. I think it'd be quite a nice thing to yeah. do one day to yes. get someone to crop those out and see what we're. Perhaps we can get Paul Paul and Seth. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try and make an effort here to just glide seamlessly into the discussion. Because it seems, seems like the discussion is already happening. Yeah. So, um, I think that, that would be a, a nice way to go. But I will uh, invite everyone to uh, uh, thank you for your